Seeing no one, we'll start the meeting. And the first item is the proposed rate increases for solid waste. Mr. Samario. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Bob Samario, Finance Director. Just real quick, wanted to mention that the reason we're here is that we are planning on setting out what we call our prop Proposition 218 notices to all of our ratepayers. As you know, we have a consolidated bill uh, for water, wastewater, and trash. And we um, typically, in early April or late March, we send out notices advising them of the proposed rate increases effective July 1. And we also advise them that we have a, a public hearing in early June every year to discuss this with council so they have an opportunity at that meeting or in advance to communicate to city council um, their, their thoughts on the proposed rate increases. So we've gotten in the habit over the last several years because of, uh, you know, we've seen some larger rate increases over the last few years with the drought and, and things like that, of coming to the Finance Committee in advance of those notices to make sure that, the, that at least the Finance Committee is comfortable with what we're proposing in case you had any concern and, and, and of course, give us any direction if you, if you felt um, so, uh, if you wanted to do so. So today we're going to cover solid waste and wastewater. I'm here with um, Lisa Royal, our wastewater systems manager. And as we've talked about, the water portion, we're going to sort of, it's going to go on a separate track and it's going to be more delayed. We're anticipating rate increases sometime in August. Um, we're just a lot more work that needs to be done with rate modeling and the like because it's very dynamic. So today we're just going to cover solid waste and, and wastewater. And I'll start with the solid waste portion. So with regard to solid waste, the, the rate increases that we come up with every year is, are, are driven by three um, factors or a, the fact that we have additional funds needed in three areas. The first is that we have an increase to the compensation that we provide to Marburg, who is our contracted hauler and collection company. Uh, and then the second part is the fact that we have, we, every year we see an increase in tipping fees, but they're a little more dramatic this year. We'll talk about that. Um, they're going up more dramatically because of our waste services agreement, which is tied to the resource recovery project. We'll talk about that, of course. And then as we talked about a few weeks ago, we wanted to also include some funding for the proposed expansion of our neighborhood cleanup services, uh, in part provided by Marburg and, and, and other parts by uh, an unknown contractor to be determined. So with respect to the increase in cost for collection services, this is Marburg Industries. Uh, as you know, we have an exclusive franchise with them for the collection of the trash uh, as, and all the materials and the hauling of those materials to the transfer station or to Higos Landfill. The franchise agreement that we have is a 10-year agreement calls for an annual increase that's equal to the CPI, and it's a specified CPI. And we apply 70% of that CPI to their compensation. The thought is that if you look at a customer bill for the solid waste portion, about 70% of that relates to the collection component, and the other 30% is the disposal portion. So we take the CPI and, and multiply by 70% and increase their compensation accordingly. And then once, once we get that in place, it's just built into the trash bill and the trash rates, and we get the money from the rate payers, and then we remit that money to Marburg on a monthly basis. With regard to a new rate for expanding neighborhood cleanup, uh, again, we've talked about this, and there are four components. Uh, one is to provide uh, uh, $10,000 to Marburg for the increased staffing um, as a result of shifting the calls that are currently going to street staff, street division staff, directly to Marburg. It's going to reduce the amount of time that that takes to get the, clean, the, the dumpings uh, picked up. Um, sometimes it's lost in the phone calls and translation and getting those, that information to Marburg. So um, this will be more efficient, but it is going to require Marburg to staff up a little bit at a cost of $10,000. We've also asked them and proposed that they increase the number of times they pick up uh, these abandoned waste um, materials, increase it from 2,000 currently to 2,500. Way back when we, we the, before the previous or the, before the current franchise agreement, they were picking up 1,000 um, of these um, collection or waste sites. Um, we're increasing it. We've increased it to 2,000 in the current franchise agreement, and we're proposing to increase that by another 500 starting July 1. The cost of that is estimated to be th th almost $34,000. The another component that it relates to that, but is not compensation to Marburg, is we want to establish a budget of $20,000 to. Um, continue the cleanup of homeless encampments. We think it's appropriate that it be within the solid waste fund, 
and um, we'll have to do some kind of an RFP process to, to figure out who actually does that work, but we want to provide some funding for, for that um, um, program. And then lastly, because um, we see some, um, periodically we'll see that there are illegal dumpings occurring in, in certain locations and it occurs sometimes over a week or two. And we're trying to address that through a targeted cleanup uh, program where in addition to the 2,500 Marber will do that they will, we can call them and they'll go out to and uh, address targeted areas um, on a daily basis as needed, but it'll be, it'll stem from a call versus, from us, from city staff, versus um, through the, the traditional phone lines where the, where the resident calls in and asks for it to be picked up. So we'll be able to um, use this as a way to target areas where we're seeing an unusual number of legal dumpings. And what we're asking for is $30,000 for that, uh, um, for that um, speci special service from Marburg. Any questions on any of this? Council Member White. Thank you. Um, in the past, uh, when uh, when city uh, city street staff was more involved, um, I remember hearing about some element of enforcement that has gone on, where people, uh, I think, as the woman uh, put it, the stupidest things happen where you know people practically will leave their business card to, uh, attached to the material. But is there? I, I'd, I'd hate to lose at least an element of that in in right. this in this effort where, okay, it's privatized now, and now there's no effort to right. at least give it a, a cursory yeah. look for accountability. Sure. Uh, committee member uh, White, we will continue to do that to the extent that's possible, because, but in almost in all cases, it's, it's a, a sofa, a mattress, or something like that, there's, that there's no identif identifying mark in there, but to the extent that we see any evidence, we'll certainly pursue that, and we'll continue to do so. Just think it would be at least with Marburg if there's an identifying you know there's a red flag here that they could that right. they'd make that they they know about it that we are trying to close that loop right. and uh, and just use that as a, a bit of a deterrent. Right, I, think. I agree. Councilmember Dominguez. So the ten thousand dollars for increased staffing that's going to Marburg. It is. So are we going to have a corresponding reduction in our cost in-house? So, no. The, the calls were coming in to the streets division staff, and, um, and so that they would take the calls, and then they would be routed to Marburg. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. Turned it off. Good afternoon, Finance Committee members. I'm Rebecca Bjork, Public Works Director. Um, we have a dispatch, um, we call it Control 10, which is 5413, and it's actually only one-third funded by streets. It's one-third funded by water and one-third funded by um, wastewater that does all of the dispatch for the city for all, all of the calls that we get, including if we have an accident we need to put out road control or a water main break or anything like that. So they do the consolidated street, uh, dispatch throughout the city. They had been receiving and have been receiving these calls and then forwarding them to Marburg. Uh, the problem is that they don't necessarily know what information Marburg needs. So they um, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily have the information that Marburg would need in order to follow up efficiently is my understanding. Um, the need for the dispatch doesn't go away with the reduction of these calls coming through that dispatch center. So there is no savings there. So did we send them emails or did we call them? How did we convey the information to Marburg? I believe it's a phone call. So they still had a person answering the phone? I, I, I don't know Marburg's end on it. Because it doesn't make sense why we'd have to pay them more if they're not adding personnel. If they just had a person answering the phone and now they have that same person answering the phone but we're cutting out the middleman, it seems like their costs would go down, not up. Good afternoon, Finance Committee, Matt For uh, Two things I would add to that. One is that a number of calls used to come in on a, an answering machine at the city. It wasn't staffed. It wasn't received. That was one of the problems with incomplete information. Marburg got notified by a number of means. One would be a list. You know, We would maintain a list or a spreadsheet of calls that would come in on a periodic basis. There might be some phone calls. There were some emails. It was really a combination of all three methods. And then what would happen to those lists or those emails? We would, we would send them over to Marburg and they would cut work orders. But that was part of the delay. 
And those all contributed to the, to the delay of getting the information to Marburg so it was actionable so they could go pick up the abandoned waste. So we're, um, we didn't call them. We would just send them via email? We did both. We would call them in some cases. We would send them lists if it was over a weekend or something, and we had uh, messages that piled up. There were a number of communication means that we used. Well, this really worries me how uh, the other in-house areas of response are uh, being managed. But thank you. Okay. Mr. Smara, keep going. Okay, the last component of the of the of what we need in terms of additional revenues relates to the tipping fees. And as I mentioned, these are the tipping fees we pay for to, to the County of Santa Barbara to manage the South Coast Transfer Station as well as the, the, the Higuas Landfill. And we have recently executed or entered into an agreement with them. It's called the Waste Services Agreement, which relates to the Resource Recovery Project. And within that waste services agreement, we have agreed to a stepped-up increase to what we pay them in the tipping fees. In FY18, next year, uh, we agreed that it would go to $99 a ton for all materials. So if we're paying $83, for example, at Tehiguas, we would be paying $99 for those materials. And for other materials, such as recyclables and the like, to whatever those fees are, we're gonna, they're all going to be at $99 per ton. And in 2019, we were estimated that those tipping fees would be at $121 a ton. We expect that they were originally planning that the resource recovery project would be online in late fiscal year 2019, somewhere around March or April. It may be later than that. So these are, but this is an estimated amount of what they're going to need in 2019. But we have committed to going to $99 per ton next year. And the reason, and the, go ahead, go ahead. Councilmember Dominguez, I think his hand went forward first. <laughs> I'm not sure. And I read something um, that there were some, uh, something was slowing down the development because of land right issues or property boundaries being misconstrued. What, what can you yes. give us an update? Yeah, committee member Dominguez, um, my understanding is that there was some, there were some documents that seemed to be, that were conflicting as to where the, um, where the responsibilities relate to where the, the, the coast and the Coastal Commission versus that what's not part of the, the area that would be subject to Coastal Commission review. Um, the, the, the understanding from the county was that this project was, not, was outside of that area, but there was a document apparently that came to surface that indicated that maybe it's not where they thought it was and that it does encroach into the Coastal Commission area. Um, so they're trying to resolve that. They believe that their original um, understanding is correct, but it is, they have to do some research, and that's going to delay the project and the financing for a few for several months. So, the ninety nine dollars a ton is this a new amount? No. So the ninety nine dollars amount will is the amount we're going to, we've agreed to do next year. Uh, what what is sort of in limbo is when the actual facility will come online. And as I mentioned initially, it was planned for somewhere around March or April two thousand nineteen. My guess is that it'll slip now into fiscal year two thousand twenty. So the tipping fee requirement in two thousand nineteen, estimated at one twenty one, may may change based on that. But we are committed to the two thousand eighteen amount of ninety nine dollars per ton. And can you explain the, the basis or yeah. some of the details Which, about that? Kind absolutely. Of That's the second bullet or set of bullets. So when, when the county was working with their financial advisors and bond council and, and, and for the bond sale, um, they recognized that it was important for not just the county but the jurisdictions that are participating in the project to, to commit to a rate increase um, over a, over a two-year period versus waiting until 2019 to go all the way to 121. They thought it demonstrated a better credit and, and, and more commitment by the jurisdictions. So all jurisdictions that are involved agree to raise tipping fees starting next year to $99, a year in advance of when the, the project is expected to be operational. Again, it was so again to strengthen the bond offering from the county, which is um, still pending. And then secondarily to that, that we also agreed to under the Waste Services Agreement to create what's called a jurisdictional rate stabilization fund. Um, both the, the, the bond council and financial advisors, as well as just from a, a rate stabilization or rate management perspective, um, thought it was appropriate to create a $3 million rate stabilization fund. Our share of that is 1.2. And so what this $99 a ton will help us do is to fund that next year, which I'll talk about in the next slide in a little more detail. But that's, that was the purpose of raising fees to $99 a ton 
for the bond purposes and also to create a, a rate stabilization fund. So wouldn't it be possible to, to push back the rate increase proportionally to the delay? I think that that would be more more in play when we get to fiscal year 19's rates setting. For, um, for ne next year, we have locked in a $99 increase, again, to demonstrate that we're making progress toward the 121 or whatever that dollar needs to be. It's going to be more than $99 a ton in, in 2019. Just so don't know exactly what it's going to be. When you say we're locked in, we've signed a contract. We, it's contractually obligated now to get to $99 a ton next year. So what would happen if we didn't vote to incre increase these hypothetically speaking? Well, we, we, we contractually obligated. The full council said that we will do this. So it would be contrary to the contract that we, the council approved uh, a few months ago. So why didn't we do the tipping fee increase back then before we signed the contract? You, because we hadn't had enough time to do all the noticing. We typically do all the noticing, and we wanted to make sure that council was supportive of that, but all the noticing and all the rate discussion occurs post-January, and uh, we signed that waste services agreement uh, back in, I think, November or December. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Council Member White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and my recollection is that the tipping fee, uh, first of all, first question of mine is, what's the tipping fee now? So it varies, but for, for disposal of trash, it's somewhere around $83 a ton. If I'm, that sounds about right? $87 a ton. So 87 was for, right. for everything. If you were to put it all for, together, for, that would for, be... For, for trash. For recyclables, it's less than that. Um, but everything will be set at $99 per ton. Okay, so um, that's a big bump, uh, going from 83 to, to 121 in... What's that? 87. Okay, 87 uh, to 121 is a uh, is a is a it is. major uh, increase in in those costs, um, and I do recall that the that the tipping fee estimates were part of it, the conversation that that occurred around the the resource recovery facility that that was definitely baked into uh, to that effort. So uh, and I appreciate that I was on the losing end of that vote, but and and. Uh, uh, and we're seeing, uh, once again, the major increase in tipping fee here. And we will be hearing back, I presume, uh, in the next couple of months about that coastal uh, jurisdiction question, which uh, could be a, a, a real drag on that project, I would imagine, if, it's, if, it, if it, in fact, is in the coastal zone. Thank you. So just to kind of... Uh, kind of get to the little bit of the punchline. I, I, we did talk about this when we had the ad hoc committee. We mentioned that while we're going to have, see these large rate increases or at least tipping fee increases, that we were going to try to use our, our reserves that we built up in the solid waste fund to help mitigate or minimize those impacts, which we'll talk about that in a moment. And wasn't there also a piece where there was there's a rebate that occurs or something? Okay, you're yes. getting to that. Yep. So this is what I mentioned. So the Jurisdictional Rate Stabilization Fund, again, $3 million will be established next fiscal year, and our portion is $1.2 million. The 40 percent represents our share of the overall waste that's disposed of currently, so our share of the, uh, the Rate Stabilization Fund will be about $1.2 million. The $99 a ton that we committed to will actually generate more than that. It will generate $1.8 million in next year. So as we'll see in a moment, when we look at kind of a couple of few years, that $600,000 overpayment will be refunded to us as a dividend in fiscal year 19. So this is, these are the components of, the, of what we need additional money for. So I, I want to make sure you don't confuse this with, rev, with rate increases for now. This, these are the revenue requirements. So the four components we mentioned, the CPI increase to Marburg for collection services amounts to 257000 um, And then for public containers, about $2,500. That's an ongoing program to replace all of our, our public containers and to maintain them. The abandoned waste component is about $100,000. That's 0.45 increase to revenues. And then the big one is tipping fees. That's $1.8 million just about to go from current tipping fees to the $99 across the board. And you can see that if you add up the middle column, that's about 9.7% of additional revenues we need in 2018 relative to, relative to what we think we're going to be this year in 17. However, we're, we're proposing next year to use a million dollars in reserves to minimize the impact of the increased tipping fees. So the effective increase in, from a revenue perspective is 3.55 for the tipping fee portion versus 8%. 
and you'll see how that kind of plays out in dollars and also rates. Any questions on this part? Don't go right ahead. So this is looking a multi-year, it's sort of a multi-year forecast, but for, we haven't done this before, at least too much on the solid waste fund, but I wanted to demonstrate to you how we're planning on, on dealing with these rate impacts because we're really talking about going from current tipping fees to $99 a ton in 18, potentially going to 121, and then it's just a CPI increase to the tipping fees that, for the resource recovery project of 3% per year. So you'll see it goes from 121 and 125, and every year you'll see a 3% increase. But the tougher years are 19, 18 and 19. So you can see that going kind of, this is looking at the total dollars, the tipping fees that we are gonna to have to pay the county are gonna be going from $5.5 .5 million in the current year to 7.4. That's, that's the $1.8 million increase we've been talking about. How we're gonna manage that, however, is we're gonna, only looked to rate payers to cover $0.8 million of that or $800,000 of that. And the balance will come from the use of reserves, which you see at the very bottom of 2018 column. You'll see use of reserves of a million dollars. And then we plan on doing the same thing in 2019. So we're gonna use reserves in 19 to offset the impacts of the increase, the tipping fees going from 99 to 121. And the other thing you'll see there is, if I can point to it, is we get the $600,000 $600, back if that we overpaid in 18, remember the 1.8 versus the 1.2, so that'll help minimize the impacts. So overall, we're looking at an 18 as about 5.3% increase to rates. Um, in 19, it's gonna be slightly higher than that, but, but then in 2020, it'll level off to in the two to 3% range, and thereafter, it'll be about the same two to 3%. The 19 is where we're gonna see a bigger increase, like again, seven, maybe 8%. But my guess is that we will, because of the uncertainty as to when the project is going to come online, that we may be able to sort of have a smaller rate increase and feather it in over a three-year period instead of over a two-year period. But this is based on the original plan and, and dates. This is how it would shake up. And just so you can see what the impact of our reserves are, you, we currently have $3.1 million in reserves. So using a million dollars per year, We'll drop our total reserves in 2020 to about a million one, million two. I expect that we're going to have some savings in certain areas, some surpluses that will add to that, some variances. Um, but on a planning basis, we think $1.1 million reserves is still reasonable to have, and it's appropriate to use $2 million over a two-year year period to minimize the impacts to rate pairs. So looking at the impacts, you, you've seen these before. This kind of gives you a question. Council Member Dominguez has a question. So then what's the plan after 2020 to restore the reserve or what would be the impact? Yeah, the what will risk? happen, and yeah, good question. So, and this relates to um, the comment that committee member White mentioned. The way we are gonna be paying Marburg, I'm sorry, the county for the tipping fees, and let's just use 2020 as an example, we're gonna pay $125 a ton. That includes making sure that the county meets what's called its debt service coverage requirements. You know, we have the same issue with our own water fund and wastewater fund. We have debt, and we have to ensure that we provide enough revenues and rates to provide a 1.25% 1 1 coverage or 125% coverage of our debt. The, the, bond, the, you know, the investors are looking for some kind of a cushion, and typically we have to cover not only 100% of the debt but 25% on top of that. So, and for in the water fund, what we do is use that extra for capital. That's how we fund our capital program. For the county, we won't have that sort of dynamic. What we're gonna be essentially doing is overpaying every year because to meet the cover, their coverage requirements, but then the following year, we're gonna get that money back as a dividend, a rebate, if you will. And it's a fairly large number. It could be it's several million dollars per year that we will get back every year because we're, we're paying them to meet their coverage requirements, but at the end of the year, since that money won't be needed for capital necessarily, they're gonna bring it right back to all the jurisdictions. And so we're gonna plan when we develop rates accordingly, we're gonna to try to anticipate those sort of variances. But we believe that those rebates would, over time will help us to rebuild those reserves. Uh, we'll be down to 1.1 1 .1 in 2020 and our goal is to get back within a few years after that to the back to the two or $3 million range. But it'll be through those dividend re re repayments from the, that the county will be providing us um, based on what we're paying in tipping fees. I know it's a complicated explanation and I'd be happy to sort of repeat any part of that. So they're using, in a sense, they're using some of our reserve as their reserve because they'll be collecting it over the year, having it sit there so the bank sees it and they're comfortable and not. Right. 
asking them to accelerate their payments. And then at the end of the year, they will refund it. Yes. So why wouldn't they just keep it for the next year and not charge a higher amount? It seems like. Yeah, they have to go through this dance. They they have to be able to demonstrate that the revenues that the revenues are coming in each year from the jurisdictions equal to it's in their case it's one point three times their debt service. Um, so it's it's a it's a big number, but they they the they have to have that money coming in as revenue through our through our tipping fees, versus just keeping that money on deposit. They will hold that jurisdictional reserve on deposit. That'll be a static number that they hold, and if they ever, in case unless they happen to use it. But in terms of meeting the debt service coverage requirements, that they have to have revenues coming in from all jurisdictions that provide that coverage. At the end of each year, then they'll rebate that back. So, is the amount of debt service? Is that uh, sensitive or is that changing because of delays in the project? Yeah, the, the delays in there aren't going to affect the cost of the project. It's just going to affect when, it's, when it becomes operational. Does it impact the lifespan? Because I assume during the delay we're filling up the landfill more, so we're just taking off kind of the back end of the, the length yeah, of the it, project? It's, yeah, for me, you know, of course. If we're, to the extent we're putting more, more trash at the landfill, we're reducing the amount of you know, how much time we can extend. You know, expanded or extended, but um, we're, we're only talking a few months, not years, so it's not really... Dip- so I'd, I'd like to see, if possible, the um, reserve strategy maybe drawn out a couple more years, 21 sure. and 22, and maybe reflect the, the, the dividend, and I'm assuming the return of that money will increase over time, yes. so maybe a graph that would show that. Really. And then also, at some point, maybe talk about, we could have something in writing about how delays impact or don't impact. Sure the value of the project. Sure. And we will be back um, sometime in May to present the slaughtered waste budget to the full council. So we'll be sure to give you a longer term sort of look um, at how these numbers play out. Great. Can't wait. Councilmember White. Uh, what's the, what's the, what are the policy uh, levels for, uh, for reserves in this fund? So it's a, it's a little different, you know, Normally, what we do is we have to have a 25% of the res- of the budget covered, you know, f- um, the reserves. 85% of the solid waste fund is just money that's passed through to Marburg. So the portion that we keep to cover our program f- uh, fees and the like is somewhere around two and a half, almost $3 million. So 25% of that is somewhere around $700,000, if I'm not if I'm doing the math right. Um, so the one point one million dollars that we expect to have at the end of two thousand twenty is still above that that those policy requirements based on just what the non Marburg portion and we think that's appropriate to measure that way. The other the other thing that if you could bring back when we come back to talk about this is the change in interest rates while this delay is happening. What what do you anticipate that to mean in terms of the county bond right. issuance? Good question, yes. Thank you. So here are the impacts of rate increases. We Every year we kind of show you some common examples. The, the first is a, a typical single-family residence, what they're currently paying and what their proposed 2018 rate uh, bill would be and what the percentage change is. Again, it's really a, it's 5.3% across the board for all customer classes. Um, multi-unit residential with cart and can service, 242 today, 256 um, starting next year. Uh, the larger uh, multi-unit residential customer will see their their bill go from 365 or 366 to 385. And then in the business uh, uh, category, those who have cart and can service, a typical business would be more on the smaller side of things would go would see about a twenty dollar increase to their to their bill. And then for the larger biz- business customers who have um, dumpster service, four yard trash twice a week, and then uh, recycling twice a week. We're looking at a about a hundred, about sixty-five dollar, fifty-five dollar increase, a thousand fifty to a, to eleven hundred and five dollars per month. So the time, sure, question. Councilmember Dominguez. So then, in, in fiscal year nineteen, there's a bigger jump in the tipping fees, but I know it's it's a seventy percent of that, and then there's another multiplier because. The uh, tipping fees is only a, a small percentage of their fees. So, are we looking at somewhere between five and ten percent again? As I mentioned, it's going to be somewhere in the six to eight percent range. Six to eight. Um, but I think it's in the end, um, it'll it'll be, wind up being potentially less than that. 
So in terms of the, the, the noticing and rate adoption schedule, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, our notices will be sent out via the utility bill through an insert starting um, in early April. Potentially, it'll be starting late March. So every, you know, every, every day we send out bills to a portion of our customers. So over a 30-day period, we'll be, we'll be including inserts so that everybody sees a note, this notice. We will have that hearing on Tuesday, June 13th, as we do every year around that time. And this is, again, where folks can come in person, write letters, or, or issue, issue their, or communicate their protest if they have some. And then the rates will take effect July 1 for services beginning July 1. So they, people won't start really seeing this until their, the, the bills they receive in August for a July service. And then we have the rate schedules available online as shown there. And unless there are other questions, I'll turn it over to Ms. Arroyo. Let's see if there's any public comment. Is there anybody in the room that wants to speak on this item? No, seeing none. Any other questions from council members? Okay, Ms. Arroyo, thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Lisa Arroyo. I'm the Wastewater System Manager. And I'm pleased to present the 2018 Wastewater Rates and Revenue Plan. Um, in my presentation today, I'll be reviewing the goals and objectives of our financial plan. I'll review the financial plan, talk about some of the proposed changes, and I will be happy to answer questions throughout the presentation as well as at the end. The goals and the objectives of our financial plan are to develop a wastewater rate structure that is based on cost of service principles and ensures revenue stability. Back in 2014, uh, we prepared a financial plan. It was a 10-year financial plan from 20, fiscal years 2014 through 2023. And that's that middle column you see up on the table right there. It projected that we, when we were doing the plan, that we had sufficient revenues to fund operating costs. However, we didn't have enough to keep our revenue, our reserves, or our program, our capital program. So that's why we saw a 5.5% increases in some of the outer years. And then they projected in 2017 on that it would be a 5% increase. When we started observing some of the conservation of it efforts and how it, um, the actual rate increases weren't corresponding to revenue increases, we did another financial plan, and that was about a year ago we finished it. And that also took into account some of the um, increases in capital that we had. We have a couple of very large capital projects that are state funded through the SRF program. And last year I came to you with a 5.5% increase for 2017, which was adopted. And I also let everyone know at that time that we were looking at 6% increases moving forward. So right now we are continuing our revised 10-year financial plan and we're proposing 6% this year as was mentioned last year. Some of the key assumptions in our financial plan, we had very conservative for our financial model using residential growth at about 0.1% per year. Um, we were flat in a lot of our other revenue accounts um, as far as growth was concerned. For inflation, we used a 3% annually, and that's for our costs for salaries, benefits, general um, services, um, things like that. And as far as interest, when it comes to debt payments, we used some of our historical interest rates. Um, as far as expenses go, uh, I'll talk a lot more about capital, but as far as operationally, what we've been projecting in our financial model has been holding fairly consistent, so everything's in order there. Um, as we take a look at our capital expenses, I showed a sli slide similar to you to this last year. We're going to be spending about $95 million in capital improvements over the next 10 years. If you take a look at that chart there, the bottom green bars are our pay-as-you-go capital. Typically, we will spend somewhere between 4 and $5 million each year funding our pay-as-you-go capital program, which consists of the collection system, the lift station, and El Estero. As part of our 2015 rate study, we um, observed that there was going to be about a $20 million increase from our 10-year financial plan that was done in 2014. And that was from our two large SRF-funded projects, our secondary pro uh, process improvements project and our biosolids project. During 
2014, we, that was the best information we had was that each one of those were about $20 million each. We have, since then, we can, uh, finished final design and have now gone into construction. And during final design, there was some additional scope added to the secondary process improvements project that made up about 10 million of that. And we've also finished a conceptual plan for our biosolids, and we have a much more accurate understanding of what the project entails, and that was about another $10 million as well. Um, Councilmember Dominguez. Just to clarify, that was $10 million on top of $20 million? Correct. Um, the actual project cost for the secondary process improvements was estimated at, in 2014 at about $20 million, and it ended up being $32 million as a total project cost. Similarly, so, to, so to me, that seems like a pretty big miss from only three years ago. It was really a add-in scope when we initially went in for the um, SRF loan. We were looking just at the aeration basins, the blowers, um, the tanks, and, and had it fairly well um, confined to that area. As we continued through preliminary design, and we ended up adding additional scope to it because we wanted to update the process. We wanted to add in the secondary clarifiers. We added in chemical, primary chemical treatment um, to make it a holistic project instead of just looking at the aeration basins. And so that's... We're getting a much better product for the extra 50%. Absolutely, absolutely. It wasn't um, a, it wasn't a miss, so to speak. It was as we're looking through and going through this process of preliminary design. This makes the project whole. This makes a much better secondary um, effluent that we can filter for recycled water. We have um, just across. Well, that makes the board. me wonder why didn't we ask for that in 2014? <laughs> Um, that is that is a good question. I think it's part of working your way through the design phase, and as you're going through these projects of that magnitude, where you're you're changing everything, um, looking at it for the future, it's it, it can be challenging. And how much do you want to take off at one in one chunk? And that was what was envisioned when we started. And that project actually started, I think, in 2010, um, with just that small portion of needing to update the blowers because the blowers are coming up on. 40 years old now and they need to be replaced and um, updating the whole process. And so this, this is the primary driver for the revenue adjustment going from, I guess, an estimated 5 to 5.5 .5 and then 5 to 6? That's one of the, the drivers, yes. The increased capital is, is, is um, and it's, if you, if you take a look at it, and I talk about it a little further in my presentation, it's the increase in debt service because these are SRF-funded loans that will have a debt, we have to start paying on the debt. And I'll, I'll show you a slide that will help illustrate that. And the, um, so the slide three, the goals and objectives in the 10-year financial plan, it, it stops at 2019. So what would that look like in 20? Is, is that in a further slide or should I ask now? Um, I stopped at 2019. Uh, we're going to be looking at 6% increases up until about 23, 24. And then at that point, I think we'll have to take a look at a new um, updating the financial plan. Um, the original one was supposed to go from 14 to 23. We updated it in 15. And so we would expect to be putting out another um, or updating our financial plan at some point. And were the numbers in, in the center column, were these all fives? for 2021, 20, 22, and 23? That is correct. And um, what would this, this these 5.5 percents, what is the uh, key for that? What is that number? That was being consistent with, if, if you're looking at 2016 or? Um, is, is this a cost of living increase? Is this a rate increase? I don't understand what the uh, metric is here you're using. 5.5 percent of what? I know it comes from the 10-year financial plan, are you, but are you what looking, is it? Are you looking at the, the last column in the table? I'm, I'm the middle column, the 10-year financial plan. The middle plan. Is, our, is our original 2014 10-year financial plan. And so we projected 5.5% increases in 2015, 2016, and then increases scaling Increases in what? Um, revenues and rates. Okay. So this is revenues and rates. Yes, because generally speaking, with the exception of when we had um, a lot of conservation efforts, increases, a 1% a increase in rates would be generally a 1% increase in revenues. Because rates is 100% is of your revenue. Our service, sil 
uh, sewer service charges are about 97% of our, our total revenue, so okay. it does equate fairly well. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to – oh, go ahead. Councilmember White had a question, I think. So we've seen – what we see down there now is sort of both sides of the street getting – with very large cranes on them, uh, and yet we're looking – so we're looking at this, this uh, fiscal year 2016 – um, that that blue chunk is what's being uh, spent there now. That, that is first uh, five million dollars. That's correct. Thank you. Um, the the blue bars are going to be our SRF uh, cash flow, so to speak. We're expecting to spend a total of nine point one in fiscal year sixteen. So you're about four and a half million in pay as you go. About four point six million in SRF fund. If they're if I'm yeah, ballpark. Yes, and then we're spending the bulk of our money for the secondary process improvement project, which is SRF funded in the next two fiscal years. We're expecting a project completion of September 2018. And then you'll see the next bar. It's very small. That's where we anticipate starting our funding for our biosolids project. Uh, we would be kicking off preliminary design and starting with um, final design immediately after the big blue bars right there in the middle that's where we would be funding construction and we're expecting it at this point to be about 30 million dollars um, one thing we have done you'll see on the last bullet we have a facility plan uh, in progress Brown and Caldwell is reviewing all of the infrastructure at El Estero that hasn't been touched by any of our major capital work that's going on down there and they have ranked all of our equipment on a consequence of failure and likelihood of failure to come up with an overall risk score and be able to take everything we've got at El Estero, rank it according to that criticality, and package up projects to meet our pay-as-you-go funding strategy. Uh, one thing we've noticed is the top five projects are electrical. We're going to be some spending a lot of money on our electrical distribution system, our substations, and as a component of that, they will be doing a peer review on our biosolids project. Uh, we did the conceptual design. It's very, uh, the magnitude of that project, not just in cost, but in what we are doing is pretty extreme, and so we wanted to have a second consultant come in, do a peer review, and confirm all of that data that we did with the conceptual um, plan. That work should be completed by about this summer and then we'll have a much better picture moving forward on both the biosolids project and whether or not our capital is sufficient moving forward for pay as you go. I'm sorry, I didn't catch. What was the $30 million figure? $30 million is for the biosolids project. That's what the concept plan um, estimated it at. Was that related to one of these? I couldn't tell if you were saying one of these. Correct. That's going to be the construction is the two larger blue bars out in fiscal year 21 and 22. Okay. So adding those two. Plus the little baby bar in 2019 should be about $30 million. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Keep going. So talking just briefly about our collection system um, component, we do somewhere around $2 million in capital work in our construction, um, in our collection system. Right there you see a rehab of a typical sewer main. We're rehabilitating or repairing somewhere between four and five miles per year at this point. We typically also fund um, any contract CCTV work chemical root foaming, asset management, and then we will be looking to fund a wet weather capacity improvement project up on Upper State. Uh, you may recall we went to council in a few months ago with the design contract. We took that money out of reserves. We'll also be looking to fund any construction component this next year out of reserves as well. We also spend um, some, some good money on our lift stations. We did a assessment back in 2012, and again, similar to what we're doing at the plant right now, outlined all of the infrastructure on a criticality basis, and we've been slowly knocking down that list. It started in 2015 with the La Colina Force Main Number 2, and in 
last year we did the Braemar force main number two. That's giving us um, redundancy in our lift stations. This year, in the near future, we'll be coming to you, the council, with the Braemar lift station rehabilitation project. It's going to be about a 20, uh, I'm sorry, a 2.5 million dollar project that will fund design this year. We'll construct in fiscal year 18. We'll also be looking at uh, rehabilitating our La Colina Force Main Number no. One. When we put two into service, we are not able to put one back into service because it is in very poor condition. And then somewhere on the horizon, we'll be looking at Via Lucero Lift Station to do a full rehabilitation on that as well. And then at El Estero, there's a picture of part of the secondary process improvements project construction. If you've been down there lately, you'll see that uh, we're under heavy construction. We have several components. Our pay-as-you-go pay um, equipment rehabilitation is somewhere around two and a half million per year. We use it to do the smaller, replacing the pumps, um, upgrading equipments, um, and then we have the strategic plan where we do our long-range uh, planning and asset management. And then I've also spoken a little bit about our SRF-funded projects. Um, I think this is a great slide that helps understand our debt service that we'll be looking at over the next several years. The blue bars on the bottom, that's our operating fund, and we do pay the capital pay-as-you-go out of our operating fund. The middle purple bars, and that's our debt payment. Currently, we have our bond. That we took out bonds in 2004. We refinanced them last year. We have a savings of about 150 to 200000 from refinancing our bonds. Um, so we make those payments. We're currently making payments on our fog and headworks projects. That's where you're going to see about um, 1.7 in those projects. As you look at 2019, that's when we'll start paying for our aeration or our secondary process improvements project. That will kick up our debt f to about 3.9 million. And then in 2021 or 2023, we will be paying our biosolids project debt, and that'll make our overall debt payment around $5.8 million. Mr. Chair. Councilmember White. So there, there's so, there are two debts coming on here the um, um, biosolids and the secondary stuff. And then there's a debt that was incurred in 2004, did you say? What year? Correct. When we issued bonds back in 2004, and then we refinanced them this, this past year. And we refinanced them because we were able to get a more favorable rate and reduce the payment. So did we extend it when we got the more favorable rate? So we kept the, the term the same. And so when does that 2004 bond get paid off? Is that a 20-year bond? 27? 2027. 2027. So that's a 20 three-year uh, bond. Okay, so 2027. So three years after this, how, what, what's the annual uh, payment on that ballpark? 150? 150,000 a year. Mm. So in okay. in in the... In the Sorry. Yeah, it, that was a savings. I don't know the actual payment. Um, okay. It's a little over a million. Over a million, okay. So one out of five, so we're going to go one out of four, so our payments will drop by 25% in 2024, 2027. Thank you. Yes. So as you see the, the horizontal red line, if we were to keep rates the same, and um, that's what that's how it would affect us, whereas if we're going, the green line shows the proposed 6% increase in how, um, and what that looks like. Uh, we have to fund reserves. Uh, as Mr. Samario said, we fund about 25% of our operating budget in reserves. So we have 10% that is we use for contingency, 15 for disaster. And then we also have a capital fund target, which is generally about 3% or a three-year average of our CIP or 5% of net asset value. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, about 97% of our total revenues are from sewer service charges. The largest component is going to be the residential component. Um, showed this slide to you last year. We've got the blue with the residential fix. That's that base component, that monthly fee. Um, that's about 46% of our sewer service charges. And then 39% is from residential volumetric. So that's the additional based off of water usage. Um, residential volumetric does make up a fairly good size portion of our revenues and so it's um, probably fairly easy to see how conservation has affected the sewer fund and that was largest hit was back in 2014-2015. Um, similarly to last year we have fixed costs that are about 87 percent and variable costs about 13 percent. Um, Fixed cost being your personnel, your service, um, and, and most of the services that we do. Then the variable costs are going to be things like chemical and electricity. How this is going to comport with the average person's bill, this is for single family residents. We have a, um, for what we call a low water user, it's lower moderate, um, six. Uh, HCF is what we're using for that number of, for volumetric use. It is going to be an increase in their bill by $2.13. Um, similarly, for the higher usage um, above the 10 HCF cap, they're going to be seeing about a $2.85 increase in their sewer bill. Councilmember Dungas, do you have a question? Yeah, the, uh, the sewer service charges slide where you mentioned the fixed versus volumetric so this, the volumetric is uh, lower here than normal because people have been conserving or the opposite? This side? Yes. That is, so as people conserve, the, um, using less water, we're, um, that's when we were seeing back in 2014, 2015, we were seeing that the, even though we were doing rate increases, they weren't correlating well with revenue increases. Now that things are starting to stable out, um, it's a little easier for that correlation to take place. We're not seeing all of the rate increases being gobbled up by conservation. So they're, they're, they're more true. We're not, we're not staying flat. We're, we're, we're seeing the rate increases now as we, we need to see. Um, yes, thank you. So does, does the wastewater uh billing system have the same regulation as the water system and that you have a minimum or maximum amount of fixed income you can drive or revenue? No. Um, not that I'm aware of. Do we have a target or what is our percentage? Mr. Chair. Your tie. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, so the uh, California Urban Water Conservation Council is what sets that threshold for water where 30% of our uh, revenue can be fixed. The remainder has to be a variable component, and wastewater doesn't have that obligation here. Um, certainly there's a big push at the state level to have variability in wastewater as well because it ultimately encourages people to conserve water, but that doesn't translate as we understand it doesn't translate directly at this point and they haven't there isn't any regulations in place right now for that we just have to have a, a variable component but it doesn't set the threshold so and based on conversations we've had in the past the uh, if I understand correctly the uh, the higher the fixed amount it actually is um, less beneficial to families on lower incomes or who are trying harder to conserve because there's just always that chunk they won't be able to eat away at no matter how much they conserve. That is correct. And it's it's one of the real challenges with sewer service that we just kind of discussed. Really, this should be one fixed amount. That's typically how most wastewater agencies do it. It's just doesn't matter how much water you use. It's fixed because that reflects what it actually costs to treat your wastewater. It's a relatively fixed cost. Um, and so we, we still juggle with that. You know, we've been talking about uh, last year it was a big discussion about whether we should be shifting more into the fixed. Um, but it, what it does is it basically lowers your cost for your big water users and it increases costs to your low water users, which we didn't feel like was appropriate 
in the middle of the drought. But I think something that we want to continue to talk about going forward to basically, I think, uh, more reflect the real cost of operating our wastewater system. Okay, so you want to avoid any regressive impact on households? That's, that's what we, at the time, yes, it's certainly trying to keep from punishing people for using less water, yeah. Great, thank you. So here's just a portion of the notice that will come out. It's typical to what we've sent out every year, showing um, everyone what they can expect as far as increases in their sewer bill. And then I took a look at what our surrounding agencies are doing. The surrounding agencies bill on it, they have an annual cost, so I just divided it by 12 to for comparison purposes. The light blue is going to be Goleta Sanitation. They are lowest at uh, $35.69. Um, the dark blue is city current, and that is, assumes the maximum sewer bill that a resident, a single-family resident would receive, and that is $47.87. Proposed is the green at $50.52, and then you have Carpinteria Sanitation, which is $51.18. Montecito is on the right at 115. Um, again, I sh uh, here's the table. It's actually pushed out to fiscal year 22. We are recommending a 6% increase in rates for fiscal year 18. Um, it's to help account for conservation additional CIP funding, and to maintain reserves. This is the same number that we talked about last year. We identified that we were going to need to divert from the 10-year financial plan in 2014 and be uh, doing 6% moving forward fis fiscal year 18 and beyond. And it also assumes that we're going to be a status quo on our rate structure and a 2% increase in fees for our fee resolution. So with that, I'd be happy to answer more questions. Thank you, Mrs. Royer. That was very comprehensive. Councilmember Dominguez. So going from 5% to 6% on the last slide, that's a 20% increase in the increase. Is that what the 2% is, or what is the 2%? The 2% the is our increase in for our fee resolution for our services, like the, the, the capacity fee, so when someone... Um, a new development comes in, they buy into the system. It's a lot, we used to term it buy-in fee, our capacity fee. Um, any of the services that we would provide, it would be, um, you know, if someone needed to put in a new sewer connection, a sewer Y, we're doing a 2% increase to keep up with CIP, uh, CPI. So those are the one-time fees mostly? It, 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 we look at it every year and adjust it accordingly to keep up with um, actual cost of service, and it's, gen it's generally about 2% um, uh, based on uh, CPI. I don't think we increased it at all last year. Um, right, but those are one-time fees? Yes. Okay. And what would be the net um, increase from the beginning of the 10-year plan? Is it double or somewhere in there? What's the – because the, these 5%, 6% numbers are compounding? Correct. Um, I have not done the math on that. I apologize. I can um, have that for you when we do our, our presentation at council. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Ms. Royal? Can I just, just clarify here real quick? Um, the 2% does not um, relate to capacity fees. We are undergoing a capacity sometimes referred to as a buy-in fee. We are looking at both water and wastewater rates for that. So this 2% really took to the other fees that Mr. Roy was just speaking of, the, really the service fees, uh, where we go out and do work in the field and people pay pay for those one-time fees. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Dominguez, you had another question? The um, capital improvement plan we're looking at this afternoon has slightly different numbers. So I'm curious which are the more recent or which ones are more accurate, the ones in, in the slideshow or the numbers in the uh, plan? This, this would be more accurate. Um, slideshow? Th this, this portion, we did project our, our capital, our six-year CIP. I did that work several months ago, a couple months ago, and as we're going through the budget process and the rate process, they all tie together. And there have been times where I've had to cut our capital to keep within our budget. So um, 
I would, this would be slightly more accurate. The PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any additional questions? Is there action that you're looking for? Yes, um, Mr. Chair, we're looking for direction from the committee as to, in terms of moving forward with the noticing this early April or late March. Um, any potential changes? Otherwise, we're going to move forward with, with the rates as proposed in this presentation. Is there any direction to staff, Councilmember White? Well, I'm just, I don't see a staff recommendation as to what exactly you want there. I think probably looking for deviance. If the committee members had difference of opinion about the approach that staff is taking to express that now, and if not, to recommend the direction that staff is, is considering. Uh, and, and Mr. Chair, as, as uh, Mr. Dominguez and I both have, have uh, ex expressed, res and this is about the, the solid waste as well as the mm -hmm. wastewater. Correct. And uh, while we ha uh, have both uh, opposed the, the, uh, the uh, resource recovery project, uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want that noted and move forward with the rates as, as, uh, as recommended by staff. So that would be my motion, uh, and I have been following, of course, the the uh, the uh, wastewater uh, capital program for three decades now, and uh, I I certainly support these these efforts moving forward. Thank you for that motion. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Um, any discussion, Councilmember Dominguez? You want me to split them up so you get to support one? <laughs> um, I'm just thinking out loud here, which is probably dangerous, but uh, I, I'm, I'm on board with what you just said, and, and a big portion of my concerns when uh, the vote took place was on the finances and how it would pencil out and uh, not getting enough bang for our buck and, and potentially having to up the rates even more than were proposed and so I'm concerned that we may end up having to do that. Nothing has, today has indicated that, but when you have delays, it's usually gonna make things more expensive. Interest rates are gonna go up three times this year, so it, it does make me worry that if the initial figures don't hold true, we're gonna be in trouble and, and you know, things happen. You know, the wastewater uh, capital improvement projects went up by 50%, so from 20 million to 10 million, and now I understand we received a much better product, and that's good, but I am very concerned, and I feel maybe a little bit locked in if, if we're contractually obligated to the county now to raise these rates, so I'm not sure if there's anything we can do to kind of balance these tensions. Is there any other way that staff sees we can kind of hedge or risk hedge our risk in this situation? Mr. Samario? Yeah, I have to think about that one. Committee member Dominguez, you know, we, we are again locked into next year's rates, which are well below what the final tipping fees will be when the project is up and running. Um, that I think is a little bit dynamic right now, again, with a potential delay. I'm not sure how much it's going to affect the cost, but certainly you're right that the interest rates have been going up. So um, I think we're going to have to have a conversation about that, what that means in term, long term in, in, in terms of actual tipping fees. Again, we're locked into next year, but for 2019 and beyond, it is ultimately going to be dependent upon um, when it becomes operational, what the final costs are, what the true financing becomes or what the true cost of financing is. You know, we recognized that early on that there was this sort of potential and risk that to the extent that we there's any delay in the project that the financing cost would go up. We initially, we were looking at having this project financed last, last calendar year, um, and it's moved into this current calendar year, so we know that there's going to be some impacts from that alone. But again, I think at this point we're we're locked into the project, and we are and we recognize the risk when we did so, and, we, and we're locked into the the final cost of financing, whatever that might be. Um, I think the only variable here will be when it becomes operational and when those rate increases will be required. So what I think I would do is I would I would vote for it, knowing that my recourse at this point would be sometime between now and the rates, when we vote again after hearings. There may be some room for uh, hedging our bets. And regarding the uh, solid waste, you know, my concerns were that we weren't incentivizing 
some of the larger multi-units. And I know um, it's going to take a while to develop the technology and inventory them. So I think I would at this point support the motion, but really uh, in both of these instances, work with staff to make sure we have a, a timeline and an understanding of what the financial implications are. That's all right. Did you have another Thank question? You. Appreciate that. Um, and that is, the, I think the concern area that I have is that the worst, a, a bad case scenario for us could be that this, the, the Tiguas is in the coastal zone and that the coastal, going through the coastal development permit process certainly will, would, would uh, engender more delays and secondly could in, uh, revise the project description and that which could add to the cost. And that's, that's that piece, if it gets bad enough, I, I'm even expecting that there would be a cycling back around if the project description becomes substantial, that there would be another vote at council on that and uh, another look at the cost. Yeah, and I would agree with that. If the scope of the project changes for sure, we're, you know, we're kind of back to renegotiating a contract. Okay, so, and that's a concern. All right, any other comments? Any comments from members of the public? Any questions? Seeing none. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed and abstained, no. Thank you. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.